Hello, everyone. Welcome back to all my listeners. Hope you're all having a great day so far. And if this is your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode three of my third season. Today is Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. My name is Sanal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now I keep diving into those smirk audits and keep sharing all my compliance tips and recommendations. I know I'm exhausted. There's simply so much under scrutiny. This week, I get into botulinum toxins. And I roll out the red carpet for a very special guest, Brian Kui, on this episode. And I also round out today's episode on a note on journeys from the great Scottish author, Robert Louis Stevenson. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you current industry healthcare news, my compliance tips and recommendations based on my over 10 years of experience in front office, back end, coding, and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy. I wanted to welcome my special guest today, Brian Kui. Brian Kui is an HIM professional with 20 years of healthcare experience in a variety of roles in health information technology, clinical documentation improvement, adult education, and auditing. 12 of those years were spent in CDI. He graduated from Florida International University in 2003 with a bachelor's degree in health information management. He is a registered health information administrator and a clinical documentation improvement practitioner. Brian is the founder of Medical Coding Geek, a social media brand for the medical coding community. He is the face group administrator for Medical Coding Geeks, the RHIT and RHIA exam support group, as well as the Clinical Documentation Improvement Network. Brian is also the creator and host of the Not Elsewhere Classified podcast, which he created to share stories and insights from professionals in the medical coding, HIM, and CDI community. My goodness, Brian, thank you so much for joining me here today. I know my listeners are in for a treat. So thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Sanal. Love it. I love it. Now, as we know, as I just talked about your amazing bio, you have your own podcast. Well, I think you were really one of the firsts to have started your own podcast way back when for this space of healthcare. So what's been your biggest inspiration here? What is your why in creating this amazing platform? Good question. Uh, Just looking back into when did I start this podcast? This podcast, not also classified, started in 2017. Uh, In 2015, to take it a little bit back, but not take too much time. (laughs) Uh, I was at a point where I needed to challenge myself. So at that time I was a CDI specialist. I'm like, okay. Uh, It was tough because at that time I wanted to get another CDI job, but unfortunately they were requiring nurses to fill those roles, even though I had nine years of experience. So to make a long story short, I felt like I was pigeonholed in my own industry. And because of that, I needed to do something to challenge myself. And that's where I got into tutoring. And that's where I, it eventually led to Medical Coding Geek. And then that's where eventually it led to Facebook groups. Then that's where it eventually led to the podcast. 
So the podcast idea became a reality because of the Facebook groups, all of the uh, activity that was happening in the group. There was a lot of questions being discussed. Uh, and I felt, you know what, let's do something about this. There needs to be conversations that shouldn't be typed. It should be spoken. And I decided, let's, let's try podcasting. Now, podcasting at that time was very new. It was just kind of growing. And I did just, I had no idea how to do it. So the biggest inspiration for the podcast, uh, the people that I, well, the person that I looked up to, and I always mention this on, with everybody, uh, is Tim, Tim Ferriss, Timothy Ferris. Have you ever heard of him? Yes, I have. He has a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, which I yes. bought a long time ago. And I've been following him since. So what happened is that he created the book, um, Four Hour Work Week. The premise of the the Four Hour Work Week is to create a muse that eventually goes on autopilot, right. <laughs> so you can really uh, do what you want on your own, like go remote or wherever you want to be. Anyways, so eventually he started to do interviews with his friend. I think it was. I think he's a CEO of another company, but. It eventually led him to create podcasts. So he created his own podcast. It's called the Tim Ferriss Podcast, of course. Of course. And I've been listening to it. So what his his premise of the podcast was for him to interview top one percenters, you know, top performers in any industry. And I figured, you know what? I think I can do the same thing just in our industry. Let me talk to people in our industry ask them questions. Where do they come from? How do they get to where they are today? Uh, talk about their businesses, talk about their aspirations, talk about their journeys. And I think it would be a great niche within our community, medical coding, HIM, CDI, compliance, even you've been on the podcast as well. And uh, just kind of, I guess, highlight the people in the industry. Selfish for, for my selfish reasons, I needed to network. <laughs> so, so instead of, uh, you know, going out to conferences or doing whatever it may be, this seemed to be the space to do that. And um, since then, I this year, I think I, I just wrote it down there. I'm about 10 more episodes away from my 100th episode. And so it's been quite, yeah, can you believe that? That's <laughs> incredible. No, I can't. That's amazing. <laughs> 100 episodes uh, of, people, of talking with people. And because of all of that, I mean, the network that I just grew just from asking people like yourself, right. Mason, you, right. you want to be on the podcast? And, yes, sir. And Bring me on. Yeah. When I asked you though, you're like, okay, <laughs> what's this all about? Right. And, uh, and you joined in because the thing is with, with our industry is that nobody asks people to tell their stories. And right. I figured this would be the best place to do it. And it's incredible. I mean, you are inspiring. You're a risk taker. I'm listening to you talk. And way back when, when you started this, you took a risk. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I see it. Yes, you wanted to be selfish and network and not do it the traditional way. Mm -hmm. But the way you did it at the time was, you know, risky. It was amazing that you brought people together that were right there. Um, you had a commonality. And so, you know, you weren't afraid. You were courageous and said, I'm going to do this. I can do this. Um, and now that I know you, um, you know, you have to be personable. And that is what you are. You're not just a, um, you know, bookworm, stay at your desk, just do data entry constantly. You're a people person. You do get yourself out there and communicate very, very clearly. And I think um, your audience, your fans, if I can call them that, um, are drawn to you because of your, your energy that you bring. Um, and then you then evoke it on to your guest also. So I think that's a key um, personality that not all people have, but I think you definitely have it. You know, I think the podcast did that. The podcast totally did that. If you listen, <laughs> I like to listen to myself, the very first one. And and it, it sounded so, I don't know. It just, it didn't sound right. Like there was something missing. Like maybe I was lost. Maybe that's what it was. I would, <laughs> I, I would interview people. And I'm like, uh, what's the next question? And, or what should I ask next? And I, I think now 
my interview skills, the connection skills, the connection, the skills. speaking skills improved. Yes. Yeah, improved over. Th- I mean, hello, yes. three years, three, yes. four years, yes. four years of doing this. You've, you've it's tightened it all up. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be. So yeah. I haven't heard everything um, in your genre from years ago, but yeah, I can presume. Sure. You know, just like my podcast that I just started because yeah. of you, I started my podcast because of you just a few months ago. And, yeah. you know, of course I can admit it. I was not very good. I yeah. was just talking. I didn't like my sound quality. I had to ask you for help. Mm-hmm. You graciously helped me, um, you know, and you just have to take a chance and put your ego aside. Yes. It doesn't matter. Um, people will listen because of your content. Mm-hmm. In my case, it's for the content, uh, not necessarily for the personality people want the personality and the charm, they go to it'll you come, it'll come out. Um, because that, it'll come that's out. your market. It will come out. So now we I a need more time. About this I've only been doing this for such a short while. It'll come out. It'll come out. Believe me, when we had a conversation a while back and, and then I know I critiqued you. And one of the things that I told you, I'm going to tell your audience is, is when you were on my podcast, mm-hmm. you had energy, you had right. energy about what I you did. did. And now when you're doing your podcast, I think you're trying to develop it on your own right? in a way that maybe if there's nobody here, how can I do it on my own? I'm struggling this with this now with, with the YouTube channel, trying to talk into a camera. How do actors in Hollywood do this? (laughs) Yeah. How do I, how am I doing this? Right. The energy that I have in this podcast, it's, it's hard to do it on camera. Right. I'm in, I'm in where you at right now, but trying to do it with a camera in my face. Exactly. It's hard. It's definitely hard. And, you know, I don't know how actors do it, you know, because if you have a solo piece, a soliloquy, you're just talking to yourself. It's Mm. very difficult to evoke that emotion if you're not getting it back Mm -hmm. from anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that is hard when you have a solo podcast. Um, but now, you know, in the time of COVID and Zoom, everybody has Zoom. Mm-hmm. It's great that we can do a podcast on Zoom so I can see you and you can see me. Um, and I just think we're better equipped to have um, thoughtful conversations. Mm-hmm. I agree. I love it. I love it. All right, Brian. So let's move on to the second question. Now, you know, on your podcast, you like to um, dig into people's backgrounds and things like that. So I'm going to just gently ask you here. So we get to know more about you also. Um, you know, we all have a past and we all have a history. So if you can, I'd hope you could share some of the steps you took to get here. If you can tell us a little bit more about your journey into becoming the Brian Kui and all of your many strengths and talents. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to do my best <laughs> now because when you tell me to tell my journey, I give you a two hour discussion, but I know we have what a few minutes here, but anyways, the, the key word that the key phrase that you said in this question is steps. Mm-hmm. So what are the, to me, what are the vital steps that I took to get to where I am today? So it had to start off with my internship, right? So I was in the HIM program uh, at Florida International University. And one of the things that you do in the program is go through some form of internship. Now, I did an internship in many places. I had never mentioned in any podcast that one of my first internships was in a morgue for the Miami-Dade County (laughs) Medical Examiner. So that was my first ever experience with medical records with, you know, corpses and and, and such, right? And dealing with toxicology, dealing with autopsy reports and all of that. So that was my very first thing. So the other one that I did was in quality uh, for coding. The other one I did was for, um, uh, what was it? Oh, yes. Uh, Talking, preparing a master document for remote work. Remote work, meaning having the employers go back home and work. This is in the days of 56K. Right. <laughs> you know, with the modems. So could you imagine trying to establish a remote master document to get people at home with 56K internet? 
How difficult and... <laughs> with that chirping sound. Do, 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 beep, 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 beep. Yes. <laughs> and then, so I, I was able to connect with a lot of people with HR, with IT, with um, other HIM department managers, right? So that was one thing. Another thing that I did was my final, another part of my final um, internship was also to be part of the HIPAA committee for the healthcare system, right? And so I did all of that, all of that. I even suggested, why don't you put the release of information form on a PDF format? So that way people don't, can you believe that technology back then? Technology back then, wow. (laughs) Nobody ever thought about it. It's good. Just put it on a PDF format, put it on the internet. So that way, if anybody wanted the form, they don't have to come over to the facility and get the form. They could just print it out and then come to you prepared, right? So nobody ever thought about that. I said, Except well, why for you. Can't you do that? <laughs> 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 and then um, after I graduated, all of those internships helped me to get into an HIM technician position, right? And so because of that, I even in, in, the, in the jobs that I've worked with, I networked. I network with other people, with other departments. Uh, I try to understand where, where am I? in my basic position as an HIM technician. And even before that, I used to work as a radiology file clerk, right? Filing radiology films. Right. And so even in my, what I feel was a basic role, where, where am I in the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. right? What happens when, when I do something in the film library, when I pick up records, when I check them up to see if they're discharged, if they're accounted for, where, what, how does this all affect in terms of healthcare? So I've always had this idea of like, okay, it, you know, kind of a bit of curiosity. That's another thing that Sounds helped me like out. It. A bit of like curi- curiosity and all that. And, and then the yes. curiosity led me to network with other people mm-hmm. and ask questions. So because of that, then from HIM technician, I uh, got my RHIA. And any, anybody who's young and got their, their credential, they feel like they can do a director job. And so I went to work for, um, as a medical records director for a, jail system in South Florida. So it was uh, five county jails in, in one county. I had 40 employees, 24 hours, 24 hours, seven days a week operation um, dealing with inmate records. And so long story short, I only stayed there a year. <laughs> it, it's it really difficult. Is it's difficult. It really is yeah. tough. It's really yeah. a tough environment. Yes. But um, it's also antiquated because mm-hmm. at the time yeah. that I was working there, they had paper records. Yes. Nothing was scanned. Uh, they were filing by last name. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you do the physical filing, but it was usually terminal digit, but it was last name. So just some weird, you got some, a lot of records in W, a lot of records in R and whatever. So there was no uh, distribution of the records when you're, fi- when you're filing them. Wow. So anyways, I took a year, I fixed all of that. Um, I fixed all of the old records. Nobody knew where they were from back in 1996. And I had to inventory them. So I had to go to a warehouse and kind of like, just, hey, this is, if I needed one page from, let's say, for example, an inmate's record from, I don't know, year 2000, where can I find it? Where is it? Right. Where is it? Do we know where it is? (laughs) (laughs) Nobody know where it was. So I spent the year just cataloging, cataloging, cataloging and everything. And then when I, when I got to a point that I had fixed it, I said, hey, let's scan this. Mm-hmm. Let's get this scan. Let's send it to a third party, have them scan it. And if we need it, or we could have it sent over there. And if we need it, they'll give it to us instead of me going there, you know, exactly. but they didn't have the budget for that. So anyways, that, that has nothing to do with the steps. So all of the stuff that I did in that healthcare system with the, in, with the internship, that healthcare system actually called me back. They say, Hey, Brian, um, could you come back? Cause we have a CDI position that I think you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? CDI. And so when I, before I left CDI had a bad taste in my mouth because Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it felt like I had to argue with coders and nurses and physicians. I I wasn't all about that. And so they said, we'll train you and uh, we'll give you a bonus and you'll definitely get some higher pay. And I'm like, all right, I have nothing. I'm telling you, I have no coding experience. Well, I have some coding experience. I have very minimal clinical knowledge. That's okay. We'll take you in we'll because, yeah. because the people that I, that I interned with, they vouched for me. 
you see. It's all about so, who you know. Yeah, yes. so it's all you know. But then they gave me a chance. Um, Twelve years later, I'm still in that role, um, and doing stuff like that. That's the key. Is if you build a network, and this this rolls into podcasting too. <laughs> so something like I did with podcasting, being proactive, being curious, yes. being curious with other people, trying to grow what you know, and also grow who you know. Uh, organically growing your network, it can lead you to other things. So all of this stuff that I've been doing for the past, what, four years now with podcasting, it's, it's opened the doors to a lot of things that I would not have expected, but it wouldn't have happened if I, what, number one, wasn't curious. <laughs> number two, uh, talk to people. <laughs> I think that's the one thing that we don't do enough of is that we're, we're mm-hmm. kind of stuck in our jobs. Why can't we cross over to other departments, cross over to, you know, I'm inpatient. Why can I talk to an outpatient person? Uh, Talking to physicians. Nobody ever think about talking to physicians because there's a level of, um, I guess, you know, I guess, uh, how do I, how do you It's like a hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah, Like a hierarchy. But you know what, the way, the way I work with people is I, I bring them to my level or an I equilibrium. Try, yeah. yeah I all, try and go yeah. <laughs> an, equal, an equalizer. Right. Yeah. So I try to go to their level and I try to make them go to, I, in, in actuality, if they're a physician, I bring them down to my level, a level right. exactly. of reality. Cause mm-hmm. I feel physicians mm-hmm. are people when I treat them like an actual person, mm-hmm. they'll come down to my level. Mm-hmm. And so all of those things in, in connecting with people, doing this podcast, interviewing others, speaking, it has opened the doors to a lot of stuff. I mean, just incredible hearing you talk about just the myriad of things you've encountered in your journey. You know, all of the experiences, um, your jobs that you took on, you've all, you've completely taken something from each and every role um, and it's brought you here. And this podcasting arena has definitely brought all of those skills into play, Mm -hmm. you know, your ability to network and leave lasting impressions on prior coworkers or colleagues, you know, who then picked up the phone and said, Hey, you'd be great at this. I think that's what all of us um, strive for, right? We all want to try and leave a mark in the work that we do. Um, leave an impression behind for either our employers or our colleagues, our peers, whoever, right? Um, So I think all of the things, even from the morgue days um, and the jail system, it's all just incredible experience that has led you to who you are and the work that you perform today and everything that you can give back to those of us here in this space the CDI people, the coders, all the HIM folks, everybody um, has something to gain from hearing each other's stories and experiences and paths to see how we can all grow. So I think it's impressive. I love it. All right, so let's move on to my next question. Um, I think you know Uh, for quite some time that I'm all about coding compliance and proactive compliance. And that definitely, most certainly spills over into the clinical documentation integrity space, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to hear your voice. What is it you would like to see happen to improve the CDI space? What types of process improvements do you think are necessary to improve this space of healthcare? Um, yeah, CDI been, I've been doing it for 12 years and I, I feel like, you know, when you look at CDI and, and the, cause I, I, when did I start 2006, right? Even before that, you know, CDI going into 2005, all of that, um, it's, it's come a long way now. Is it a good way? There's, I mean, there's some goods, there's some bads. Right. Um, but when we look at the full evolution of how, uh, from when it started up until now, the way I see it is CDI, it's kind of like the electronic health record, right? So when you start off with electronic health record, there's no, I I guess my, my idea is let's focus on the data. So with an EHR over the years, it gathers data. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And at some certain point, you have to figure out what do you do with that data? I think right now, CDI is at that point where they have all of these systems, all of these things that capture the queries and the answers and all the agrees. Now we have all of this data. And so with CDI professionals now, we have to know what to do with that data. How can we figure out, you know, what are the real problems in our healthcare system? What are the areas of documentation that we need to work with? Who are the physicians that need the most help? You know, those type of things that we need to figure out. Um, that's, there, there are companies that do that. Uh, and I've had people that come to our podcast and they talk about disrupting the CDI industry with mm-hmm. data, which is very good. What does that mean? Disrupting the, 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 the status quo of CDI is always, answer, you know, placing your queries, making sure they're getting them answered. Uh, more, the more queries, the better. That to me is not the way to go. Uh, the, when I look at CDI improving it, we have to shift our ideas of instead of placing queries, the same thing, like when I talk about, you know, communicating with physicians, putting them at our level, right. You know, the CDI program should not be in, in, in any way against physicians. It should be for physicians. Exactly. And if you direct your CDI program in that way that you are assisting them, they will come to you. That's another thing too. We can't be chasing physicians. The physicians should be coming to us because they should realize Mm -hmm. that CDI is a great asset for them, especially with their documentation. When they have good documentation, they have good reportable data, especially with all of this value-based stuff that's been happening. Um, they need to have good data. And, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're not at that point yet, but we're trying to work our way through. Um, but yeah, we need to fish, you know, shift from queries. To me, queries are very impersonal and we need to get more personal, you know, uh, with initially, now initially, let me tell you the truth. Initially, when I was a CDI specialist, I wanted to go remote. <laughs> really? <laughs> because, yeah, I'm like, this could be done at home. Right. But then, but then, I kind of shifted my ideas a bit because what was I doing at home? More Mm -hmm. queries, right? More More queries, queries. more follow-up. Hey doc, you know, you're sending an email. Can you please, can you please address this query? It's more like a task telling physicians what to do. Where's the connection when you leave, when you go to another remote site. And so again, it should be for physicians. So by you leaving, you're kind of losing that, that personal connection. So I think we need to come back work with physicians who are there, uh, be side by side with them. Um, that is the idea. Another thing that we need to look at too, uh, that I just had a conversation, <laughs> a conversation about earlier, which is perfect, uh, <laughs> is when we look at the idea of CDI programs and clinical validation, my question for people who have, are involved in these programs that are trying to do clinical validation or possibly dealing with denials and appeals and all that. Where are your clinical policies? Do you have them? What are you basing it on? Don't tell me you're basing it on the industry. Don't tell me you're basing it on guidelines that physicians are talking about. (laughs) If they are, where is it? Where's your policy? You see? So whenever they get denied, it's like being caught with their pants down. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's well said. They don't have a policy to back it up. Well said. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, I'm sure there are facilities that do, but what about the facilities that don't? Now, here's the thing. In order for you to build a policy, I guess there needs to be more of a budget being pushed into the CDI program. So basically the core skeleton crew of a CDI program is your CDI specialist, your CDI, whatever, manager, director, that's it. So what I, what I, would, I think I've been seeing lately is the CDI specialists who, you know, do all the chart reviews and all the, you know, all of the CDI metrics, all of that regular stuff. And then the, the manager oversees everything. Then there needs to be a CDI auditor, right? I agree. Auditing all of the queries. Auditing. Yes. Yes. And then making sure they're doing great. Also a CDI educator. Yes. um, Who can go both ways in terms of communication for both (laughs) education to the CDI specialists and then education to the physicians. Yes. So in other, in, other, in other words, they're kind of like the liaison between CDI and the physician. In the same regard, also, you need to have a, C, uh, a physician champion, but those get very, they're very hard to find. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah. it, takes, it takes a really good physician to understand both the clinical side and then apply the coding concepts. 
So if you're asking me for my all-star team <laughs> of a CDI of a CDI program, I mean, you, you if you're the CDI director or CDI manager, you you want a top-notch CDI program, that's what you have to pitch for. You know, a physician champion, your CDI auditor, your CDI educator. So that way you can provide and instead of just doing the line item work, you know, the the low level, not the low level, but the field the field work, mm-hmm. right? worried about the chart reviews and stuff like that. What about beyond that? What about the education? What about identifying opportunities that are happening with the data, people that can actually look at the data? We don't have people looking at data. They're just grinding the charts grinding and just the charts. Yes. placing the queries. Mm-hmm. And then what happens afterwards? Who's looking at that? Mm-hmm. You know, not the CDI director. I'm sure that that director is like torn in five places because they need to do that. So they need to have somebody kind of like a mid-level manager to do the auditing and then do the educating. And then in the same regard, those two people should also be building the policies. That's how I see it. I love it. I love how you see it. I love your team that you've created. Now, who can we take this idea to? Like, how can we um, take this to the higher level, to the C-suite? Like, who do we take this to? Because I like your team members here that you've created. I think they would be very useful um, to create more, uh, you know, integrity for the CDI space. Yeah, I, I, just like in anything, I guess you need to garner support. So wherever mm-hmm. the CDI program is, quality, HIM, mm-hmm. HIM and coding. So I, to me, if it's if it's under HIM, you have a better chance because you have uh, the health information management, you have coding, and you have CDI. And then you take that also, I guess you have to do some lobbying work with quality, mm-hmm. right? And then, you know, get, get, get that kind of sense, like, Hey, we need to have this team. Can we, and then you take that proposal along with your team and you go up to the Hill. Yeah. I like this because it's, it's disruptive, but it's disruptive, um, with an Mm. end goal in Mm. mind, not just for the sake of being a disruptor, Yeah, you know, we have an end goal in mind. And of course it's all about protecting our physicians. That's what the bottom line is all about. It's all um, compliance is, is for that reason. Is and to even protect protecting the, the, the healthcare family. facility itself too, when you think about the it facility in terms of too. compliance. Yeah. Right. So especially with fraud, waste and abuse, everything yes. that you talked about in your podcast. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I love your insights. That's perfect. I know my listeners are going to really, um, shine about that because it's all CDI and, you know, not everybody is aware of, um, the critical needs that are missing. And I really think this, uh, team, idea that you've created can go far. We just have to have the right people help, help us to take it there. So Mm -hmm. I think it's it's a great idea. Yeah, it's out there, but you just have to, um, some places don't have it. Don't have it. Right. Yeah. But if I think if, if, if we're going to take this a step further, you want to find facilities that have it. Right. And And make that the example, like look, it's working here. Mm -hmm. Look at how great this facility is. Yeah. There you because go. they implemented my team idea from mm-hmm. Brian Kui. Like, mm-hmm. He has this great <laughs> idea of these team members that don't exist, but they exist at this facility. Let's make it a model, you know, and then disseminate it throughout the country, mm-hmm. region by region, whatever. It's a great idea. There you go. I love it. I love it. All right, Brian. Now it's on to the last question. I can't believe our time is almost done, (laughs) but on to the last question. Now, what are you still striving for? Where am I going to see you in the next five years? Um, let's see. Well, right now I have a YouTube channel, right? So fabulous. The, the challenge is though, because speaking to a microphone in a podcast is so much easier for me because I spent four years doing it. Right. You've had practice. <laughs> yeah. I've practiced a lot, but now I'm taking whatever I learned from here and then putting it in front of a camera and then taking the editing skills, as you know, <laughs> through podcast editing. Right. And then adding a couple more layers of things to edit. To edit. Yeah. On top of that. Mm. So the way I see what I'm doing with YouTube is is trying to find a different way to do presentations, find a different way to do webinars, because who wants to see 
somebody talk with a PowerPoint presentation slide in their face? Why not make it interactive? Why not show yourself? Right. Because that's the thing that I don't see in this industry enough is people showing their faces, showing their personality. Um, if you don't have personality, when you get on a camera <laughs> or if you get on a microphone, it will come out the same way that I'm telling you. As, as you progress in your podcast, your person, you'll find your personality within that will eventually translate to the microphone. I am now at that point that I need to translate my personality from this microphone into the camera. So I've already done a few episodes already and I'm looking at myself just like, you know, when I looked at myself in the beginning of the podcast time, I'm like, this is not right. You know, it doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. Like I, I don't feel as I, as I always give my advice to you, where is so now right. in your episodes? You do. You do. You do tell me that. <laughs> where is the so now that I know that I, when I interviewed you on my podcast, where is the so now that I interviewed you on your podcast? So I've always given you that type of mindset. So the same advice that I give to you, I need to give to myself. Where is the Brian that I have had in the podcast in the video space? And so what I did test on is I'm going to show you is doing the vlogging. You know how people get the cameras and they just yeah, and they show them. like your everyday life. So, yeah. And yeah. I think to me, that is so much easier. It was easier just, for you. Yeah. Wow. To talk okay. instead of talking a microphone, I would, you know, do in, instead of um, recording 20 minutes straight through a script, I would rather do, you know, two minute segments on a that camera. And then put it all together and then, put it all and then together. submit it out as one vlog. And then edit. Oh, I yeah. see. So I, it, there's no, I, I gave myself the permission to not provide structure in these vlogs. So with these vlogs, it's like total random conversations. Mm -hmm. For example, before we did this episode or doing this episode, I actually gave a little synopsis. Oh, I'm talking to Sanal Patel today on her <laughs> podcast. And I gave some little bit of feedback. So you'll see that in the next vlog. Nice. So those are, <laughs> those I are love some it. things that I do. But um, the next five years, so I told, this is funny because my wife says um, she doesn't want to work no more. She's has, she's going for her bachelor's in nursing. She's going for her master's, I think in amazing uh, wow. health informatics, I think. And so I said, well, what are you going to do next? And she says, well, I don't know. And so I, 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 I felt like if she has a five-year plan, I said, I think I should have a five-year plan. I, said, yes, okay. I, I told her my five-year plan is this, this YouTube thing. And so hopefully by then this would probably, you know, I, I always mention her name a lot, but, but Victoria Mall is something that I've, is a person that I've always kind of looked up to. She is in incredible. Victoria Mall, if my listeners don't know her, um, she has the Contempo Coding podcast mm -hmm. and her YouTube channel. Um, she is amazing. Yeah. She makes it look effortless. Yeah. So Victoria, if you're listening today, we're talking about you, your ears are burning. <laughs> you're amazing. Again. You're Again. amazing. You make it look flawless. We know it's difficult, but thank you for showing us that it can be done. <laughs> One of the things that, that she did that, that really, really, I, th I guess, um, opened my eyes is that she quit her full-time job. And That's now right. She, does she did that. put that out there on her yeah. channel on her, yeah. on her, yeah. I think on her, um, yeah, her social media. The day that she she quit her job, she put in her resignation letter. I'm like, oh my gosh, if that is that a thing that I can do in yeah. five years? Maybe because Maybe, she yeah. the thing is she put in the time. The same thing, other people such as um, Victoria Mole. Another person is uh, Blue Garcia, which I also had on my podcast. She did the time in putting in those videos, mm -hmm. and so the same way, the reason why I created the podcast is because. Because aside from connecting with people, you are building your own portfolio, your own portfolio, portfolio. of what conversations that you yeah. have. Like if people come to you and say, oh, uh, how did you deal with the situation? Oh, uh, let me pull something out of my portfolio. And you could take a listen to that. Right. Or whenever I do presentations, guess what I do? I take podcast episodes and pull them out. Matter of fact, I'm actually doing one for Main Mania for AAPC, I think in Oakland, California on building your professional brand. And guess who's going to be one of my case studies? You. <laughs> no <laughs> so, way. No, I'm not. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. For building your own personal brand. So uh, wow. you will be one of my case studies on how you built your podcast and all of that. Awesome. So Thank that's you. what I'm doing things. So going back to the question, five years. So YouTube would be it, right? Um, I'm hoping to build enough of a portfolio that it would um, 
just get me by, you know, to, to fulfill a full-time income and where I'm just doing podcasting, I'm doing video, uh, building an academy, hopefully, <clears throat> to where when you think of monetization, how you know, all the stuff that you do, Brian, you're doing it for free. You got to figure out how you're going to get it paid. Right. That's the five-year plan. So That's try to figure year. that part out. How am I doing all of this and how it's eventually all the work that I'm doing, mm -hmm. how is it going to benefit, benefit me in the end? And mm -hmm. I have to do it in a smart way. So that's what I need to figure out in five years. Now, what you haven't asked me yet is what happens after five years, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I mentioned this on a couple of podcasts. One thing that I really want to do in taking this YouTube thing is to get into film. Uh, Stop and, it. And, yeah. You're going to take YouTube to film? Yeah, from YouTube and try to do film. And film what? Film. Look at Hollywood. Yeah, film our industry though. Film CDI, film HIM, film, film medical coding. Well, you did say this on another session, didn't you? I did. You and did. So the, the goal is, very I mean, exciting. I'm not going to be Hollywood, you know, I'm not, I was just <laughs> joking, gonna, but you I'm know, not going to get an Oscar or anything. Hollywood will send out well, the maybe, red carpet well, maybe, for you. We'll, I know they will. We'll, It'll we'll be think fine. about that. It, it could be a goal, <laughs> but it, it could be an outcome of what I'm doing maybe. But my, my ultimate goal though, is to create a documentary and put that documentary somewhere. Great it, idea. Maybe, maybe Netflix, maybe Amazon prime. It, it could be just four episodes it could be medical coding. It could be HIM, CDI, compliance, whatever it may be. But it's just a video on healthcare. The reason why I say that is because when I look at Netflix, there are there's one. It's called the Surgeon's Cut, right? Mm -hmm. So the Surgeon's Cut is all about all surgeons from different specialties from around the world. So well, why can't I do that? Why can't you do that? Exactly. Why can't I do that, right? I love that idea. <laughs> I love it. So there's, there's another one. It's called Song Exploder. Song Exploder is a podcast that I've been listening to for such a long time. Um, I forgot his name, but he is Indian though. Uh, yeah, Indian host, Ricky Kesh Sherway, something like that. That's his name. Anyways, his, his, his podcast is he takes a song, he takes the artist, and he has them break down the song into different components and have them explain the song. That is the podcast episode. And then they translate the, that podcast episode into film in where they're actually conducting the interviews in person wow. on set. And he has four episodes. Now he has four episodes and two volumes. So now eight episodes on Netflix. You can totally do that. If I could just do that. You could yeah. totally do that. And I think the thing is, is that when you, when the, all of this stuff and going back, let me go back to Tim Ferriss then. Right. So all of this stuff goes back to Tim Ferriss. So Tim Ferriss had created a book, right? And then created a podcast. Mm -hmm. And guess what? He took the podcast, his portfolio of all of the top performers. And what did he do? He created two books, right? Of all the people that he has interviewed and took that portfolio and made it into uh, one big work. And so he's done it twice. Amazing. So if he's done it twice with books, why can't I do it with film? with film? Why can't I get, you know, that's, right. the, you know, all of the stuff that I'm trying to do is a learning process for me, mm -hmm. you know, but in, in, in essence, I'm actually giving to the community. You but absolutely selfishly, are. Selfishly, I'm trying to do it for me. Right. <laughs> well, I, I totally get it. But that's you're, the plan. you're growing yourself, yeah. but you're also giving back. I think you're definitely doing both things. So yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Well, I win -win can't win wait situation. to see your five-year plan mm -hmm. and after that film. Very exciting. That is, yeah. Wow. You'll, be, you'll probably be on the film. Who knows? <laughs> I'll give you a call. Hey, you want to be Hollywood Sanal? <laughs> <laughs> I can go to Hollywood. Sure, 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 sure. Oh my goodness, Brian! This has been an incredible conversation with you, as always. Um, just amazing. So we've gotten a hint that you have a YouTube channel. Um, where else can my listeners find you? Because I know um, so some of our channel, listeners of are shared, but some are not. So if you could just tell us where oh, we yeah. can find you. Well, you could find all things, uh, everything that I do at medicalcodinggeek.com. Uh, from there, you could find everything. You could find the Facebook groups. You could find the podcast, the Not Elsewhere Classified podcast. Uh, you could find the YouTube channel. Um, what I'm trying to do with the website is kind of centralize everything. So I created a separate blog that... 
captures all the YouTube videos and all the uh, podcast episodes. So I'm actually having to kind of transfer all the stuff into one, kind of consolidate everything into one. So that's where I'm at. Um, you could find me on Facebook, uh, Medical Coding Geek and Not Also Classified. Uh, everything is, for medical coding, it's uh, at MED Coding Geek. And for Not Also Classified is at NEC Podcast. So you can find us Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. And then uh, Medical Coding Geek is on in LinkedIn. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Brian Kui. Last name is spelled C-U-I. Excellent, Brian. I'm going to make sure I put everything in my show notes also so everyone knows where they can find you exactly. So thank you. I just want to thank you so much for your time here with me today. I have just had such a fantastic conversation. Um, I'm so happy to have you here as a guest and you're more than welcome to come back anytime you want. Awesome. Thank you. And now it's time for my best practice tips and trusty tip. Let's dive into my compliance tips here in part 11 of my smirk audits that are blasting in across the country. Remember, these are the 16 new Unified Program Integrity Contractor, the UPIC audits that are being conducted via the Supplemental Medical Review Contractor, the SMIRC at Neridian. Their function is to conduct nationwide medical reviews of parts A, B, and DME providers and suppliers as directed by CMS. It's the responsibility of the SMIRC to review medical records and related documentation to ensure that claims are processed in accordance with CMS guidelines. Now, I've provided you with details for 10 audits in prior episodes that involves durable medical equipment, or DME, supplies in non-covered skilled nursing facilities known as SNFs, spinal cord stimulators, outpatient hyperbaric oxygen therapy, also called HBOT, diabetic testing strips, or DTS, polysomnography, also called sleep studies, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, those are our, our ERFs, <clears throat> skilled nursing facilities, of course, our SNFs, specimen validity, therapeutic shoes for diabetics, and intravenous immune globulin that are current audits in the SMIRC's spotlight. So let's get into part 11 of my SMIRC audits. The 11th is titled 01-030 Botulinum Toxins Notification of Medical Review. Now, Noridian SMIRC is conducting post-payment review of claims for Medicare Part B for botulinum toxins services billed on dates of service from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th of 2019. Remember, these are the time parameters. This notification includes the reasons for the review, documentation that will be requested in the additional documentation request letter, the ADR, as well as resources that providers and suppliers may wish to consult with as they're submitting their claims. Now, some background on the why, right? Why on earth is this audit happening? So let's go over some background details. Now, botulinum toxins are potent neuromuscular blocking agents that are very useful in treating various focal muscle spastic disorders, as well as excessive muscle contractions, such as dystonias, spasms, and twitches. Botulinum toxins are also used to treat headache or migraine when qualifying criteria are met. However, botulinum toxins, if they're used for the treatment of wrinkles, are in fact considered to be cosmetic and it's not covered under Medicare. So of course the reason for this review is critical and they are narrowing it down in scope for us, thank goodness. The scope involves Noridian SMIRC performing data analysis and conducting medical record reviews. Noridian SMIRC will complete data analysis and review activities in accordance with applicable statutory, regulatory, and sub-regulatory guidance. They're honing in on place of service 11 for the office setting. They're also honing in on four HixPix codes. Now, the first HixPix code is HixPix code J0585, which is defined as injection ONA botulinum toxin A for one unit. The second HixPix code 
is HixPix code J0586, which is defined as injection, ABO botulinum toxin A for five units. And the third HixPix code is HixPix code J0587, which is defined as injection, Rima botulinum toxin B for 100 units. And the fourth and final HixPix code is HixPix code J0588, which is defined as injection, incobotulinum toxin A for one unit. And now, of course, there are going to be documentation requirements as well, right? So I'm going to go over a list of six specific, very specific documentation requirements that will be in your ADR letter. These are the items that you will have to furnish to support your claims that are already paid now that you are under review for your post-payment audit. Now, the first documentation requirement are those physician orders to support the services being billed. The second documentation requirement are all of the pertinent medical record documentations to support the patient's medical condition and the procedure for the billed services, which should include the history and the physical, the progress notes, the consultations, and the procedure notes. Now, the third documentation requirement is going to include that legible handwritten physician and or other clinician signatures, right? And also provide a signature attestation and signature logs if those physician and or other clinician signatures are simply illegible. Now, the fourth documentation requirement has to be that valid electronic physician and or other clinician signatures. The fifth documentation requirement is going to be that advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage, that ABN, if it's applicable. And the sixth and final documentation requirement is going to be any and all other documentation to support the services that were billed. So remember, these post-payment audits are a sign, right? It's a signal that something may be amiss in your documentation, your coding and billing. These six requirements are a very good reminder that you should be making checklists and improving workflows and efficiencies at your practice to ensure all documentation is being captured and coding and billing are compliant for all applicable statutory and regulatory guidelines. So a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Absolutely right. I think this is a perfect quote that reminds us, inspires us to keep taking steps, planting the seeds in our journeys. There is no hurry. We must be patient and tend to our dreams. Tend to our dreams without the expectations of immediate success. A lifetime is filled with twists and turns, so remember our dreams may need to adapt and change as well, right? So new seeds need to be sown. I am happy Robert Louis Stevenson's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves, and aim a little higher and do a little more and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. As always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. And if you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy, practice safety for one and all during our collective life in the time of coronavirus. Thank you so much for listening in on today's very special episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.